Welcome to Chef Marketing Academy. This lecture is on why is it so hard to innovate. As you know, people have ideas, customers have ideas, entrepreneurs have ideas, inventors have ideas, but any one of those ideas becoming a success, business success, is almost the odds of one in million. And those odds are not as good as the odds of winning a lottery. So this lecture is primarily focused on what comes in the way from good ideas to become a commercial success. We have two theories out there. One theory is that it's all internal culture, the mindset of the people in the organization, and that comes in the way. I'm, in a, I'm not a strong believer of that theory. My view is that intentions are always good, which is why companies invest money in R&D. Lots of patents are created even. In fact, some of the large corporations have more patents than what they can do with them. But the reason why many of these ideas do not see the light of the commercial reality is because of the structural problems. So I'm going to give you a sort of a counterintuitive or a non-traditional uh, or a counterpoint essentially to the prevailing wisdom about why is it so hard to innovate. So let's start the journey. The first slide here is the traditional model that we all talk about in the academic world as well as practitioners do it. And that is the innovation funnel. The innovation funnel begins with ideas. Many of those ideas are not inventions, which means you cannot solve the problem even though there is a need out there. A lot of customers have unmet needs. They are frustrated in the marketplace. Nobody is satisfying their unique needs or differential needs, and they have ideas of what to do. In fact, the best place I've found uh, most of these ideas have been in my days, my generation, a column called Hints from Heloise. Customers are quite inventive. Customers are quite innovative. They use the product for purposes other than what the company ever imagined possible. And this lady had a column, daily newspaper column, where she would invite homemakers in those days to talk about the unique ways they used, for example, a cake mix, or unique way they used a, a cleansing material or something like that. And I was always impressed how versatile the customers or the consumers are actually. And this is true also of immediate customers such as retailers. They do a lot of ideas about what can be solved for the end customer. But inventions are very hard. The inventions means you have to get it patented or you have to get some intellectual property right from that one. And that is not an easy step. From invention to innovation, which means you may have a patent, but to make it into a viable product is even harder. So lots of ideas filter down to inventions. Lots of inventions filter down further into innovation, which is some tangible offering in the marketplace, whether it's a service offering or a product offering. Then market adoption comes in, which means products that we offer it after doing a lot of research, surprisingly, we find that almost 50 to 65% of all new products fail in the marketplace, so market adoption. And even if market adopts the product, surprisingly, we find that there is no business model there. In other words, the product is good, customers want the product, but the cash flow or profitability is just never ending process. So ultimately, the business collapses strictly by starving itself, having not enough cash flow. You may get the venture capital to survive for a while, but eventually you run out. And we have seen this thing happen in the dot-com era, enormous number of new ventures that were created with the excitement, uh, lots of them fail. In fact, my estimate is that in the dot-com world, probably 90% actually failed after getting the money even. So that's the reality of the world. So the odds of business success of an idea are less than one in a million. Winning the lottery has better odds. That's the fundamental point that I wanted to make. Now, let's look at the dramatic expansion of inventions 
and these are US patent uh, office data. Between 1988 and 2008, the number of patent applications in the US patent office grew more than three times from 150,000 patents per year to 485,000 applications for patents per year. Nearly 50% of the patent filings were of foreign origin, which I think is another very key change taking place. It is not America who is the inventor and an innovator and a commercial success, but the rest of the world is using inventions and innovations as their key strategy. Of course, they come from traditional countries like France, Germany, Japan, but I've seen more and more growth of filing for patents from emerging economies such as China, such as India, or Latin America like Brazil. As a consequence, grant to application ratio has declined from 64% in 1987 to 38% in 2008. This data could be updated and I can assure you the trend is in the same direction. More filings for uh, patents and uh, less acceptance of those patents because the cumulative pool of what has been already granted creates actually a bottleneck for the next idea to be inventable or to be patentable. So why this enormous growth of inventions? And what I've done is to identify five different forces that are driving the tremendous interest in inventions leading up to innovations. First one is globalization of competition. Competition is no longer domestic. Competition is already becoming global and the most dramatic example would be the cell phones. Think about cell phones invented by Motorola in this country taken over by Nokia from Finland based upon the GSM architecture in Europe, which means they got a, actually a whole market delivered by the government regulation or government licensing procedure. Now the market has shifted to Asia. The largest market for cell phones is China. Second largest is India, for example, where cell phone is everybody's uh, device or a necessity, in fact, including the most illiterate people in the most rural populations and the most metropolitan people by and large. And in the cell phone handset device, now the power has shifted to Samsung, a Korean company, but eventually it might even go to somebody like HTC or something like a ZTE out of China. It seems like Chinese domestic uh, our players may actually go into more mass market cell phones and the same game will be played with smartphones and with tablets. Second reason obviously is a speed of the breadth of technology breakthroughs. Speed first of all is most key. Things are happening more rapidly than we could have ever imagined possible and the breadth of inventions not just in the IT world that we all know, such as the computers, the cell phones, the tablets, the applications, uh, etc., the apps as we call them, but these breakthroughs are happening across all sciences. More exciting sciences are nanotechnology and biological sciences. As many breakthroughs are happening and they're happening rapidly because the foundations are laid for more inventions, such as for example, the digital age that came in and the platforms created for that, or such as, for example, the decoding of the human genome, which has led to so many discoveries for very specific targeted diseases and the nanotechnology. I think these three are probably transformative as much as the mechanics and the, and the, and the physics were, for example, for the first industrial revolution. Third area is changing policy and regulation. More and more governments are now liberalizing, privatizing markets. So markets that were captive to a monopoly positions, there was no need to change. So they would behave very much like a banking model, a utility model which says that so long as we have sufficient cash flow risk covers. But once the same industry is actually liberalized, privatized, allowed for competition, suddenly you see the growth of inventions taking place and that's what has happened. And also as we reform regulation, which means one form of regulation created a certain technology architecture, 
regulation changes, so you create a new technology architecture, and in the process, you make enormous, in fact, uh, inventions. Uh, my view is that the healthcare reform taking place in the US and the healthcare reform taking place in UK, for example, will lead to a lot of innovation in uh, healthcare delivery, drug discovery, for example, medical devices, just goes on and on. Corporate mission for growth is the fourth area. Unfortunately, as the world economy has been slowing down, including emerging economies to some extent, and as we have a high rate of unemployment, the cost cutting and the bottom line can go only so far, which companies have already done it. They did that in the restructuring of the economy in the 80s in America, for example. But now, by the way, in the 80s, we created concepts of re-engineering, for example, re-engineering the corporation, downsizing, outsourcing, all those buzzwords came in as a way of creating more efficiency and cost cutting. But now, companies are ready for top line growth. In fact, the analyst in the stock market and the investors are demanding more growth as the platform for rewarding the companies, uh, shareholders essentially, in terms of uh, market cap. So you have seen, for example, Apple enormously growing in the process. And Apple has done a fantastic job of creating a market cap by showing growth where people didn't imagine that kind of a growth would be possible for a company and all that came through a new uh, architecture. If you look at Apple innovations for iPhone, iPod, or let's say iPad now, basically it's nothing but putting together in a very clever way the hardware and the software from existing technologies. Sony used to do that at one time, but Sony does not seem to be able to do any more. Sony was the inventor of the Walkman, for example, before that one transistor radios, which is the origin how they began, it's the same thing. So growth is now a key driver as a corporate mandate, and this is why General Electric publicly has announced that we will be more growth oriented. And the growth does not come as much through mergers acquisitions as was the model or inorganic growth. Now the growth is supposed to come organically. So organic growth is becoming the corporate mission, which is driving more inventions, more investment in R&D, et cetera, et cetera. And the last one is most interesting one, which is a, there's a worldwide rise of entrepreneurship. While in the Silicon Valley, we have already seen this thing and they've created a multi-billion dollar, surprisingly, wealth and lots of jobs at the same time. How our entrepreneurship is universal. It does not recognize gender, that means men and women both are as good entrepreneurs. It does not recognize ethnic group, any kind of a race. It doesn't matter whether you are African American, you are Hispanic, you are Asian, or you are a Caucasian white, makes no difference. It does not recognize any religion at the same time. Entrepreneurs are from every religion that one can imagine. It does not recognize literacy. The most scientific community is entrepreneurial, such as the Silicon Valley or the medical community. But at the same time, you see most illiterate people becoming very successful entrepreneurs, as it is true in Bangladesh, as it is true in emerging markets, as it is true in all countries by and large. So this entrepreneurship seems to be the new, basically the DNA for inventions. And since the reward in the marketplace seems to be greater for entrepreneurship as opposed to a traditional corporate life, where you started your job after, let's say, college education, if not high school education, and you stayed for the company till you retired, put 30, 40, 50 years of life, that model is gone now. In fact, most young people never imagine they will be with a company more than three, four years. And as many successful entrepreneurs have created wealth, such as Bill Gates, for example, such as, for example, Google founders more recently, the Facebook, the Twitter, whatever we think about, there's a lot more, therefore, a herd mentality for everybody actually to be an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurship is taking basically the talent acquisition in large corporations. They don't want to stay for a long time. And second reason why entrepreneurship is rising much more so is what I call entrepreneurship by necessity. 
when you have lost your job after working 10, 15 years in the downsizing, restructuring, outsourcing, you suddenly realize what do you want to do with your life? Do you want to work for the company or all the experience that you have and all of the ecosystem that you created over 15, 20 years, can you become an entrepreneur? And I've seen this second, third time in my life. In the 80s, quite a few actually became entrepreneurs by doing nothing more than franchise operations. In the 60s, that happened with McDonald's. Now it is happening, same thing with pizza. But there is a chain that's doing fantastically well, and uh, most of the franchisees are well-educated people. They are not strictly, in fact, hardworking, working-class immigrant people as we used to have as franchisees and so is in hotel motel business. I mean, I can think about any imaginable business and you see corporate executives or managers becoming entrepreneurs, which is what I call entrepreneurship by necessity. So these are the five major drivers for a lot of ideas and inventions. The next slide really talks about most inventions do not succeed commercially. There is a quote by the Director of Office of Public Affairs for U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And the quote, I think, is very telling. There are around 1.5 million patents in force in this country, that is U.S. And of those, maybe 3,000 are commercially viable. Think about the ratio, 1.5 million to 3,000. It is a very small percentage of patents that actually turn into products that make money for people. I think he succinctly tells exactly the reality of the world, which is why I say that you are better off winning a lottery than being successful from your idea into a commercial reality. It takes a lot more, it takes an ecosystem, it takes operational excellence, just goes on and on. Ideas are just not enough. And in fact, we often say, you know, inspiration is 1%, perspiration is 99%. It is all about execution. It's all about organization that makes all the difference by and large. So, innovation resistance. Why companies resist innovation? Ironically, as the demand for innovation increases, which is the translation of invention or an idea into a product or an offering, as the demand for innovation increases, so does internal resistance. It's so counterintuitive. The leadership, which is the culture, mandates that we must invent, we must innovate, as it is a worldwide fever right now, is my view. But even then, it does not succeed. So problem is not culture, as I mentioned, problem is structural. So ironically, as the demand for innovation increases, so does the internal resistance, even though innovation often means survival, not just thriving, but just surviving. And this has been true wherever there has been a fundamental change in the paradigm, a disruptive technology has come in, such as analog to digital across every industry I can imagine, or from dumb, uh, products or machines to adding smartness into them. What is called the fusion where you add electronics such as automobiles for example, such as machines, uh, such as you know uh, machine tools just goes on and on. I can think about a lot of industrial products which are electromechanical but adding that intelligence makes all the difference and some companies are able to do it and others are not able to do it. In fact I'm told I've never ridden myself but if you take it today Caterpillar uh, big construction equipment or a John Deere combine. And if you are in that cabin where the operator sits, it's nothing but a high-tech computerized world. It is as high-tech, surprisingly, as an aircraft. It is as high-tech as a military plane, even though it does traditional agricultural or construction work primarily. The more radical the innovation, it's interesting, the greater the internal resistance. So this led for me and my colleague, S. Ram. Ram was my student at University of Illinois. We both got very excited about this idea as to why people resist change or innovation, not consumers where we have a lot of research done. 
but I'm talking about internally in the corporations. Why ideas or inventions do not commercialize or do not get the success of a business success essentially. And we had a book written called Bringing Innovation to Market. And that book actually was written some time ago, but the principles are as fresh today as ever. I just wanted to mention that because this research about innovation resistance is already now 30 years old essentially. We have focused quite a lot innovation adoption or innovation creation because the Western culture, especially the US, is very much in fact Joseph Sumpeter, an economist, and his belief uh, that constructive destruction, competition is all about constructive destruction. That's how capitalism thrives, creates more wealth, more well being for everybody. So we are very pro change on the one hand. That's the mindset. But in reality, it does not happen. And hence, we wrote the book identifying five internal barriers industry or a company suffers from and five external barriers, which are customer-oriented market barriers. So here are the, some of them that I will talk about. If we understand why innovations are resisted, we might be able to design strategies to overcome internal resistance. Problem is therefore not cultural, which I'm repeating third time because I think there's so much of literature on culture and leadership. My belief is that the problem is all structural, which means the way we are organized, our processes, our reward system, this is all basically structural issues. And I will identify five structural things that come in the way in this lecture. The five sources of internal resistance are the following. The first one is super specialization. And the more the industry is patent driven, the more it begins to specialize. It's highly fragmented. The competitive structure is called monopolistic competition, where even though your market size and capacity is very small, you command the monopoly rents or premium prices. That's because of the patent base of the industry. Semiconductors is in that category. Nobody has a large market share in semiconductors. If you take the total semiconductor industry, it's all fragmented. Each one has a proprietary patent. So is true of pharmaceutical. Even today, after mega mergers by Pfizer on the one hand, GlaxoSmithKline on the other hand, for example, the highest market share holder in pharmaceutical is still under 10%. And the pharma industry is growing with the aging of the population and emerging economy shifting from homemade remedies or traditional medicine to more modern allopathic medicine. Still, market size is highly fragmented by therapeutic class, etc., etc. Second one is inflexible operations. Operations were hardwired not for invention but for efficiency. So I'll get into that more details of each one of them. Our third one is lack of resources or insufficient resources. Anything new, we don't allocate largest share. We just do an incremental allocation from existing cash flow, which is the existing offering, the exist existing operations. Sometimes the regulation and accreditation keeps more the status quo rather than a change. So we'll talk about how do you change a regulatory framework or even accreditation policies of bodies that accredit a given profession, for example. And the last one and the very key one is access to market. It's not market receptivity or consumer resistance. Even if consumers are wanting to buy your product, have the money to pay for it, there is a whole access problem. How do you access that market, which is mostly distribution aspects, which is reaching market reach or accessibility, as we call it, and hence access to market. So these are the five sources of internal resistance that I will focus in the rest of the lecture. The first one is a plot that I have just shown you, that if you plot specialization on the horizontal or the x-axis, from low specialization to super high specialization, and if you plot on vertical axis what is called versatility or flexibility, you will find that actually it's a sharply declining curve. In other words, when specialization is very low, you can have a much greater flexibility of your operations and your mindset even. I've seen scientists 
who are trained only in certain super specialization such as in medical delivery like doctors or um, a specialist especially. I have seen that thing in uh, Bell Labs engineers, I have seen this thing at Tektronics, I have seen that General Motors tech center. I work quite a lot with the R&D organizations in companies which I find most enjoyable. Surprisingly, I like the R&D area very much, but I find that the more a company is and their R&D department highly specialized, then they are not able to innovate anything outside of their own specialization. And that is where the problem arises. But it is a very sharply declining curve which says that the more you organize around an idea, like you are a washing machine company like Whirlpool, you have automated washing machine. You only think from that automated washing machine as opposed to innovating in a totally different way how to clean clothes for example. And uh, the examples I have in the chart are Xerox could not do computers and IBM could not do desktop copiers interestingly because Xerography is a very specialized technique or a invention or an innovation. Pharma in biotech is the other one super specialization by therapeutic classes and within that one by a certain uh, molecules and within that molecule a certain drug discovery process. So, these are the places where if there is a disruptive change that comes from outside the industry, outside the geography, it becomes a huge problem for the incumbents in generally. So, this is called the curse of incumbency. For example, Kodak in camera business or film business. So, how to overcome this super specialization? When your core competency becomes a core reliability from a technology viewpoint, you need to break through in a very aggressive highly intervention way almost as if you have just discovered a chronic disease. There is no way to simply say it will go away you have to have a aggressive intervention and here is one technique people have used called skunk works. A dedicated cross discipline team isolated from existing location and existing people. Skunk works was a phrase created by Lockheed in the military aerospace industry and they literally had a place in California northern desert where nobody knew this highly classified secret work. And this does happen today for example, in centers for disease control and prevention. Lot of germ warfare issues are coming in the minds of the people. It is happening in cyber security today for example, lot of cyber attacks are coming. You have the skunk works that is thinking away from the day to day operations, delivering the cash flow, delivering the margin etc. which is typically an operational thing you set aside. Best example I can give you surprisingly is IBM success in personal computers. IBM was a mainframe computer company making more expensive like millions of dollars of installation of a mainframe computer like a original 7070, 7090 to 360, 370 then 300 series etc. But the PC revolution was beginning. In fact, in many ways one has to give credit for IBM to pioneer and the reason why it succeeded is that they had a separate dedicated division altogether. But they knew that their own internal R&D organization and manufacturing cannot produce low level semiconductors, 8 bit processor, 16 bit for example and they actually got that from Intel. They sourced it and rest is history Intel became the largest manufacturer of semiconductors with the PC revolution. IBM always sold directly. Now they figured out for PC business there is just not enough revenue for sales compensation. So, they came out with a distributor model, a third party distribution encouraging several franchisors like computer land you might remember as a name and selling through third party distribution which they succeeded quite a lot. It also encouraged enormous applications from other people on a PC platform. So, PC compatible had so many applications not only Microsoft obviously for Windows which was their strategic partner, but also surprisingly in fact other applications. So, 
This was one first time IBM ever did that. So, skunk works means a dedicated team, cross functional, doing totally different separately from uh, the traditional business, as if there are two parallel things happening. I have seen this in Bell Labs in a slightly different way, where any new area to create technology, Bell Labs will create three different teams. And each team will work independently to come out with a solution and like an internal competition, an internal race, and ultimately the management will decide or a lab director will decide which of the three technologies to be blessed for commercialization. Second way to overcome super specialization is research alliances. Strategic alliances between institutions and individuals willing to share their complementary expertise for mutual benefit. You have a common problem of some sort and there are several examples. One of course is uh, Unix. Bell Labs led along with seven or eight other mainframe computer manufacturers. There was an IBM monopoly. IBM would not share their own uh, uh, machine language for example or a high level language like Fortran or uh, you know whatever the languages before C++ and everything that came in more recently and was very interesting COBOL I think is my memory and so you came out with an alternate architecture for mainframe computers called Unix and the rest is history. Similarly you have a consortium of telephone equipment manufacturers ATIS is the organization A-T-T-I-S and ATIS is a standard creator as they have done in the broadband for example or DSL as we know it at one time, uh, backbone fiber optic standards for traffic. Similarly, you have the consortium for the internet. So, internet has become a de facto standard of networking in some fashion by and large as it is happening with mobile telephones where the GMS becomes a common standard. So, you create research alliances and corporate labs and academic institutions often have a strong research partnership. For example, most pharmaceutical laboratories will be working with universities, uh, medical schools such as John Hopkins, Emory University, etc., etc. Similarly, in fact, I have seen in uh, surprisingly dairy products, lot of uh, joint research done between College of Agriculture scientists, for example, and uh, the dairy producers uh, such as people who produce milk, butter, etc. Right very fascinating and agriculture is more common. Uh, the third way to overcome super specialization obstacle is acquisition. Acquire the expertise through some merger and acquisition. IBM acquired expertise for their future to go into consulting business which IBM was not good at by buying out PwC, the consulting side of PricewaterhouseCoopers for example. And they also bought Lotus Notes and everybody was surprised why would IBM buy outside but Lotus Notes became a great acquisition in terms of the mainframe computing architecture. And of course GE in the energy business they are a manufacturer, the future was in services like a utility company and they bought almost like 105 small niche companies and put it together into GE energy services business. So acquisition is the third. Uh, approach to doing it. Second major obstacle as I mentioned is inflexible operations. Companies in their early days after a great invention and a successful commercially successful product get organized around making that product in a very efficient way such as a mass production, mass distribution. Ideal example here that comes in my mind right now would be uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola decided to go into the bottling approach from a soda fountain. So now you invest in bottling plants, but in those days bottles came only in glass. Then you find that people would like to buy their soda like they buy their beer in cans or in plastic bottles. That requires enormous capital investment. In fact, any company that starts with a new packaging material or a new packaging format has an advantage because you have this install base of multi-billion dollar investment. 
and that investment is made jointly with a franchisee who basically resists. This says, why would I obsolete my own capital dollars? There are accounting rules that come in the way. There are financial reporting things. Every imaginable obstacle comes in. Your operations are incompatible with the invention. So when there is an incompatibility of the invention into existing operations, you have inflexible operation problem. It includes your procurement. It may include your supply chain. It may include your manufacturing processes and customer support. Any place you may have, and that comes as a bottleneck. So landline telephone companies had a hard time in terms of wireless services. So landline versus wireless is a key differentiation. Procurement is totally different. Vendors are totally different. The retail store operations are totally different. So how do you manage that? Same thing I'm finding sitting on the board of a stem cell bank from a blood cord of newborn babies. The stem cell therapy is so different than a typical clinical trial or pharmacological therapy, for example. And the two are just incompatible in the way they do business, right? So how do you overcome inflexible operations? The first one is, just like the previous problem, have a separate operations created. And despite all of the problems that GM has gone through, including going for Chapter 11 protection, etc., getting government investment into the company, General Motors actually was quite ahead in terms of learning how to make small cars by creating a separate company. Think about how big these guys were, $4 billion of a standalone division called Saturn. It's like a management experiment in a new way of doing business to compete against small cars that were coming not from Europe, but from Asia. Like Toyota small car, Nissan, Honda, and some of the Korean cars. And it became a management laboratory. We have seen the same thing in the movie production. You have the animation studios, which are separate operations altogether. So one is to establish separate operations. Second one is to modify existing operations if possible. This is most useful when physical plant or land resources are of significant size and scope. Generally where you are better off modifying it is because investing into the new one is a lot of expense or the existing capital is so large that you can't obsolete. So how do you modify that? So for example, fast service restaurants as it is called, fast foods, home delivery is a very different operation than dining in. As you know, a newer company in pizza actually gained the advantage, Domino's, by delivering home delivery. But Pizza Hut, the incumbent, couldn't do that a good job. It took many years, but they were able to ultimately succeed. McDonald's, the largest franchisor, even today cannot do home delivery because operations are so different. So if you can modify your existing operations, as retailers are doing, that you can have dine-in, which means come and shop and buy. You can order it online and pick it up in the store, or you can have it delivered at home. They are able to mix now both the brick and clicks, essentially, as we call it which is very key. And media are going on the internet, which means your content is now created and distributed so that it is not just on the broadcast media or on the print media, for example, but it can be on the internet at the same time. Most broadcasters now are actually saying, if you want more in-depth news, go to the internet site of some sort. And they're storing a lot of content they've created over time, which is mind-boggling to see how much of uh, they're able to modify existing operations. Third one to overcome inflexible operations is modify the value chain. Limiting modifications to a specific part of the value chain. It could be global sourcing, for local manufacturing. So it could be that while at one time you, for local manufacturing, you sourced locally, now you create a global supplier. In uh, steering wheels for automobiles, I've seen that, where one of the Indian companies called Sona Group supplies the steering wheels to Toyota. 
Now they would like to take this company and make them as a global supplier for Toyota operations all over the world, or at least in Europe and Asia. This is true for all of the turn signal people makers. Automotive component suppliers is one place where the automobile manufacturers are saying, we have to make products locally, but we can have a global supply, so you just slightly modify your value chain. I've seen this with Lex pantyhose. Legs is a great, great example I like to talk about in transforming the retail distribution by having the pantyhose on a rack. And they had at one time, my memory is like 120,000 racks distributed all over supermarkets, convenience stores, or even, for example, hotel you know, lobbies where you will have a uh, gift shop or something. You could buy it any place. And the distribution system was, they were able to modify their existing operations and survive and grow in the process. The third major issue is insufficient resources. Insufficient capital or talent, not just capital, to fully execute inventions potential. Uh, best example I came out here was primarily in preparing this uh, uh, lecture was the supersonic Concorde. Boeing tried and gave up eventually. Airbus tried, gave up also. You did have a consortium of four governments to create the Concorde. And Concorde became a standalone operation, but even then ultimately they found there was just not enough market, primarily because it was a very high energy consuming, very noisy plane, like a military plane. While it could do supersonic speed, economics were not viable. And ultimately, with one crash that took place, there were only two customers, Air France and British Airways, for example. It was like a government, uh, public-private partnership. And then ultimately, once these two carriers were privatized and were accountable to the shareholders rather than government ownership, they decided there's no way they can make it a viable, profitable passenger revenue generating business. The British Airways even try to have it like more a excursion. You fly into Egypt pyramids, you have your lunch there, for example, then you fly some other place, you have your dinner there, and you're home in a day or two days kind of notion. Even that they could not survive. And the same thing is true about new composite materials like Kevlar. These are very expensive ways to make things. Inventions are there. But to make viable products becomes very difficult. So how do you solve the insufficient resource problem? Or the best thing, surprisingly, is to license the technology you invented. Who said that because you invented, you should make it, you should distribute it, you should sell it, you should service it. More and more companies are learning that licensing is a better way out for make a business success out of an invention or an innovation. So DirecTV, Hughes was the inventor, and they allowed manufacturing of the DirecTV installation pretty much by companies like Panasonic or Thomson Electronics because they have access to retail distribution. Hughes is a B2B and almost a aerospace military company. This is a commercial side, and DirecTV has been a great success on a licensing model. I did that work at Texas Instruments by strongly encouraging them to go for license when $600 million of R&D on their balance sheet was generating $1.2 billion in uh, royalties. No manufacturing plant can ever deliver that kind of a return and these royalties have a long life. It is not five year, 10 year uh, amortization of manufacturing capital. You are talking about getting returns 10, 15, 20 years. F-16 aircraft, which is a part of the Lockheed uh, weapons maker. While F-16 aircraft is obsolete because they have come out with the next generation, there is a multi-billion dollar and I would say 25, 30 year life left in terms of making money through either offset, which means you share manufacturing with somebody else, you license them, or uh, servicing old installed F-16 fighter jet a fleet at any military government, for example. Royalty revenues are far superior in my experience than manufacturing revenues. Second one, how to overcome insufficient resources is to franchise it, which is a similar idea. 
A franchisor comes out with a concept. He puts operational details. He knows how to procure, organize properly. And then you have franchisees who are licensed to operate. Coca-Cola success in bottling plant happened that way because all those were wholesale bottler franchisees. And the same thing is true for Radio Shack, Snap-on tools, which is basically a business-to-business -to -business, uh, tools and accessories. Uh, Ace Hardware is the same way, and these are all franchise operations. Franchising is so universal. While we think of franchising only in the fast foods, I think franchising is everywhere, and that becomes a good model when you don't have the resources to do your own stores. Starbucks has done it, but it's an exception majority of the companies in this business will actually have a franchise model with a new idea. Third one to overcome insufficient resources is form a consortium. So both competitive and complementary companies get together to develop a common technology to create a de facto standard. Let free gasoline came that way. It was a cooperation, surprisingly, between the government on the one hand automotive manufacturers, as well as, in fact, the gasoline producers. This led to the catalytic converter that GM actually invented and licensed to everybody. As General Motors is doing with OnStar right now, which is a tracking mechanism in your car, either by satellite or in their case it's more based on the cellular uh, technology, and they're licensing to other companies or jointly developing it. In space programs, this is very common now. Joint space programs by European countries, for example, and sharing and cooperative uh, cooperation between Russia on the one hand and America, who were otherwise basically enemies to each other. And apps for smartphones, which we already know the amount of applications or apps for iPhone and iPad is mind-boggling and it's still starting out. The next area is to invite venture capital. Venture capital, Silicon Valley has clearly shown, is a very viable mechanism. While I like venture capital, and we have some world-class examples, I use the venture capital in a more broader sense. It is not start-out companies, but many private equity now are willing to invest into, surprisingly, startup companies. If you look at the Facebook pre-IPO capital and how it came, it came from Goldman Sachs which is interesting. And it didn't come from, from a venture capital company uh, alone, for example. It's a large amount of investment they made, I'm told it maybe like four or five billion dollars or something before they did the IPO. So today boundaries are bl blurring because corporations now have venture funds. Sovereign governments have their own venture funds themselves. So venture capital means any outside capital that comes in to help you carry out the journey so that once you have started your growth, you have therefore a survival rather than a collapse from growth itself by lack of capital. High speed rails is a good example. Silicon Valley, we already talked about uh, Facebook and uh, Google. The third one to overcome insufficient uh, resources is public-private partnership, which is the hottest area going right now, often created by World Bank, sometimes International Monetary Fund, now it is much more government to government, as it is happening, for example, where the Chinese railways to be built in California will be a public-private partnership. So my experience has been with Manipal, which is the largest medical college in the world. They have produced more graduates than anybody that I know. In Malaysia, 25% of all Malaysian doctors were of Indian origin. Government did a strategic plan vision 2020 and came to a conclusion that as many as 90% of the doctors in Malaysia would be of Indian origin as opposed to Chinese origin or Bhumiputras. So with World Bank coming in, Manipal as a private operator, generating college, you know, medical uh, students, came out with a brand new facility in Malacca, which is the old capital, I'm told, in Malaysia. I've gone and visited, actually. And there they began to invest into having a, a hospital, which is very key, and all the equipment, obviously. And that investment came as a private-public partnership. Manipal Group themselves would not have been able to at that time. 
Uh, China is investing in African infrastructure in a big way. And surprisingly, now we see large foundations like Gates Foundation or Ted Turner's contribution to United Nations. These are billions of dollars. They are now investing as foundations with the government on the one hand and private sector on the other hand. And this is happening where Gates Foundation has publicly announced that they will invest millions of dollars annually in the healthcare all over the world. Regulation and accreditation is the next fourth area. Uh, this includes rules and regulations, accreditation and the certification of occupations. So we already know FDA, Food and Drug Administration, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, USDA, US Department of Agriculture, and there are many more. Doctors, lawyers, accountants all have to be certified and recertified through continuing education. Then you have the patent and antitrust laws that provide regulatory framework. Technology is not allowed for commercialization or highly regulated, such as stem cell therapy so far, at least in the US. Space exploration is a government venture. We are just privatizing it now. And cloning. So these are the kinds of things where regulation is a very key framework. And therefore, how do you innovate while being regulated? There are two extreme answers. One is to deregulate the industry. And I saw this happen with airlines, trucking, etc., under Carter administration in the late 70s after the first energy crisis. So Carter administration deregulated the power grid, for example. The utility industry cannot be vertically integrated where they own generation and distribution at the same time. If they have excess capacity in generation, they have to provide into a national grid regulated by some other agency. And telephone services were also deregulated pretty much, began in the late 70s with long distance and eventually complete deregulation of the industry. So airlines, telephone services, trucking are great examples. And it is happening in other countries, especially in emerging markets where markets used to be regulated, they're all becoming much more privatized, liberalized, and deregulated. Second one is change the jurisdiction. In other words, rather than this regulatory agency, you go for another regulatory agency. So this involves shifting the jurisdiction from one regulatory agency to another one. So we used to have GATT, General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, that began to shift into a worldwide new organization called WTO, another regulatory agency now. Homeland Security came, therefore security became not only local issue, but also a federal issue. Huge change in the way airport security came about, for example. And as I mentioned in telephone industry, they enacted a new law and that became the basis called Communication Act of 1996, which was absolutely incredible to allow and encourage convergence between voice, data, and video, as opposed to keep them as separate silos by regulatory framework. Third way is regulatory reforms. This requires regulatory changes themselves to spur innovation. That means companies actively lobby for regulation in a way to create market. In my another lecture someplace I've talked about one of the largest ways to create market is mandatory consumption. If it is good for the society or deconsumption of a product that is bad for the society like cigarettes. So, and it may happen with drugs more and more. So we have seen through regulation creating markets for seat belts and airbags, smoke free places pretty much worldwide now. And of course, a lot of healthcare reforms are coming through changing the regulatory framework, not deregulation, but different form of regulation. So last area is that if none of this works, which is external affairs, one can actually organize the company itself into two different buckets, a set of businesses which are under regulation and a set of businesses that are non-regulated. In the telephone business with the breakup of the bell system, every one of the seven baby bells was allowed to be in regulated business, which is the traditional telephone where you have subsidized rates. The prices are not controlled by you, but by a local 
uh, utility commission for example and you had the unregulated businesses such as selling equipment installing equipment or wireless technology etc and you create two separate companies and you become a holding company not as uncommon this is a very common way and i think that's going to happen with the banking and the financial crisis the banking reforms now that are taking place will basically make sure that the bank assets which are the deposits are not used for very risky investments such as for example risky structured instruments or derivatives etc it can be done through the non regulated part same thing in uh, uh, accounting you had the uh, audit business which is somewhat regulated by certification and certain laws but then you have the consulting business that was non regulated so audit versus consulting is a third example last one of course is public private partnerships which you have talked about in education becoming more common like charter schools which are non government operated schools public health we have seen this quite a lot of cooperation large infrastructure projects it is obviously a necessity pretty much when you build roads when you build railroads when you build airports seaports etc and the whole area of economic development more and more governments are asking corporations to invest into sustainability into economic development especially in emerging markets last area that i will talk about is access to markets which is the last barrier structural barrier it comes in access to market is a common reason for failure of very affordable and disruptive innovations radial tires i remember that no traditional tire maker will allow when michelin came out with radial tires in america their distribution goodyear goodrich bf goodrich and firestone and they controlled large market or independent multi location tire distributors or retailers who bought from these companies would hesitate to buy from a foreign competitor only reason why radial succeeded in america was there was the largest retailer of tires was sears under sears private label big tire makers such as goodyear firestone bf goodrich dunlop never allowed the tires to be sold with a private label they refused because it was creating competition between their own retail distribution and uh, sears michelin had not these problems because they did business only in europe and they came out with surprisingly the distribution sears demanded a private label they had no problem and they created the private label and rest is history michelin became very successful starting with sears brand of tires and then introduced their own brand of tires same thing happened with upton machine company which is called whirlpool sears was the market maker marks and spencer has done that in england and all over the british empire walmart does it today for example carrefour from france does the same thing it goes on i will not have time to go into all of the details but thermography was a new technology against mammography which is a xerox uh, type film making essentially to imaging and it turns out that thermography could not get off the ground because a market they could not access the market technology for detecting breast cancer for example entry into foreign markets is another big nightmare and often you have to distribute through a competitor who has a distribution in place as i have seen in agricultural chemicals such as herbicides pesticides or fertilizers power of distributors is enormous i remember square d company always sold directly to the end customers realized that they have to now sell through gray bar and granger to large distributors and the rest is history a huge market access and of course often lack of infrastructure comes in the way so how do you overcome market access as i mentioned once before with michelin example you became a supplier to oem in other words you don't have your brand and the supplier is a huge market maker so rockwell did in the modem business to ibm mainframe computers and rockwell actually was more profitable that way than if they had gone directly to end customers for example and it is a part of what is called plug compatible manufacturers and there's a whole case history written 
about how IBM made so many suppliers, such as people who made printers, for example, people made other equipment around a CPU or central processing unit, which is a mainframe computer heart, essentially. IBM did not make all the components. They were more like a system integration. Chinese manufacturers, probably there's no better example. The whole Chinese manufacturing growth came not by their own brand names, but becoming private label OEM suppliers to large American and eventually worldwide corporations. Foxconn, you might have heard about that one. This is the one who makes the product for Apple. All the Apple design and architecture, hardware, software, such as the iPhone, iPad, etc., is all made in mainland China by Foxconn, which is one of the largest contract manufacturers in the world. Second way is to supply to private labels, which means you create a separate brand name. And usually in the retailing, this is becoming very common now. Companies like Target, even Walmart are now putting their own brand other than a store name. And they're doing a great job with private brands. And those private brands are creating enormous asset value. And it is possible if you have the technology and you have the competence, then you can share in co-ownership of that brand with a market maker. So this is happening for uh, grocery products like Whole Foods. This is happening for Kroger to some extent. Rather than having a Kroger brand of groceries, uh, such as cereals or detergents or napkins, whatever they do, they create a whole new brand. I'm working myself in this area with a large retailer in India, for example, how to create separate brands by each of the product categories. I mean, as a narrow as a neckties for men, shirts for men, different brand, versus a trousers for men, different brand, versus a suits for men, different brand, and have different manufacturers who supply that because most retailers don't like to manufacture. Third way is to develop your own distribution system. If you're not able to break through it, you create your own. And of course, this is the success story of companies like Tupperware, which still survives, I'm so amazed, or A1 products in cosmetics. Tupperware is for household plastic products. Apple stores is a great success story recently. And I'm told that more than a billion people have visited Apple stores, which is an independent distribution system, while they also sell through the telephone operators such as AT&T, Verizon Wireless, and their counterparts all over the world like Vodafone out of UK. Our next one is online marketing. And I think this is becoming a much bigger play than we have ever imagined. Going direct to the end users by using online, uh, both information, procurement, transaction, and fulfillment, everything can be done. And of course, the biggest transformer in the uh, publishing business or in uh, book distribution business has been Amazon.com. And what Amazon did very successfully for books, they are duplicating for other products and for services now, surprisingly. So online banking, online airlines now, airlines do not issue anymore. There are no travel agents, no intermediaries. They bypassed pretty much by creating online platforms. Huge capital investment up front, but at the same time, uh, your operating costs drop enormously per transaction by and large. So let's conclude this seminar. Why it is so hard to innovate? While there is an enormous growth in inventions in the last two decades, unfortunately, most inventions do not become viable innovations due to internal resistance. As I mentioned in the opening comment, I don't think it's as much a cultural issue as it is a structural issue. Internal resistance is therefore more structural than a cultural problem. There are five sources of internal resistance. If the industry or the company is super specialized, if it has inflexible operations, it has resource constraints for whatever reason, I'm talking about financial and talent resources. It has a regulation constraint, some fashion, either through certification or by laws. 
or it has a problem of access to the market. The new invention is so different that to train a distributor or a sales force is going to be very difficult. Then those five uh, will become the key bottleneck. Successful companies have learned to overcome these obstacles. IBM in the PC business, as we talked about. Motorola, I did not talk in the lecture, but in mass customization, that a very inflexible operation in a factory that made pagers, but they put, for example, cycle time procedure, TQM, of course, Six Sigma procedure, and total customer satisfaction, and transform the factory from making one type of a pager to making millions of different varieties of pagers at the same cost as making one type of pager. It's a classic case study that I know. Deregulation of the wireless industry has been dramatic and probably the only way telephone companies have survived is my view. And Amazon online in order taking has been another major great example. So I believe that we need to understand why companies have internal resistance. And internal resistance comes not from cultural aspects or mindset or even leadership. It is just how do you change your structural aspects to come out with a new invention. And I have given lots of strategies companies have used, very practical, very implementable for each of the five obstacles that come in the way from invention becoming or in innovation becoming a successful uh, business. Thank you very much. <music>